It's Momita, it's a pleasure. Uh, it's my pleasure to give this talk. So let me just start the screen sharing. So, so I think we've got it right. Yeah, okay, excellent. So uh, it's my pleasure to uh, give this talk uh, seminar uh, to uh, you all. Uh, let me first uh, tell you why I have this fancy party shirt. So, of course, this is Friday weekend already here, but uh, I always feel in a party mood when I meet up with uh, my old students. And, you know, it's, it's lovely to see Momita here. And uh, next, I'm looking forward to the next time I give a seminar in person uh, there again. Uh, so this is, uh, I think, April 2012 was when I gave my last seminar there. Uh, so I think, yeah, okay. Um, so let's uh, talk about uh, uh, the cosmic hemispherical asymmetry. So this is a nice observer's picture for what uh, we have uh, naturally provided to us uh, by the universe. So if we are here and now as an observer and you look 14 gigaparsecs away as almost all of you would know uh, that there is a glowing screen uh, which is the microwave background uh, which is essentially not, uh, completely uh, consistent with the black body which is our strongest evidence that uh, we uh, have the universe went through a hot dense uh, past right and that's our one of the most strongest evidence for a evolution from a very hot, dense uh, universe. But we see something more there. We see these fluctuations that are imprinted on it since uh, that's already again, more than uh, about 30 years, close to 30 years now, not more than, but close to 30 years, which gives us uh, evidence that there was some new physics yet to be discovered, which gave rise to the origin of structures in the universe. And these structures are, of course, magnificent uh, the distribution of galaxies and super in you know grouped in clusters and superclusters, which is a very important part of our uh, you know studies of what we understand about the universe. Nevertheless, the cosmic microwave background is our signal from the electromagnetic uh, spectrum that reaches furthest out into the universe and reaches a time far back in the history when the universe was only 500 million years old. Uh, more recently, of course, people are also getting more ambitious and want to explore very tiny distortions in the spectral of CMB, which will take us back to a month from its uh, so-called birth or you know, extrapolated uh, Big Bang. So this arena is uh, you know, one of the best places in my opinion, to check for the fundamental assumptions that we make in our study of cosmology. So one of the fundamental assumptions that we have in building any cosmological model, and this was ever since Einstein talked about his first model, is to assume that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. So which means that the fluctuations that we see in the microwave, although that's an anisotropy pattern around us, Statistically speaking, the anisotropy fluctuations that we see, uh, the fluctuation of anisotropy that we see, or even the linear polarization, should be statistically the same everywhere if the universe has no direction to it. Okay. And about in 1997, uh, even just a couple of years before I became faculty, I sort of started thinking about a generic measure to you know, establish this, uh, which is independent of any assumptions or models, because I, I was looking at cosmic topology at that time, and I realized that there were reasons to believe that the, uh, this symmetry could be violated. And uh, so that led to, uh, you know, and that is important because the standard cosmological model, which has emerged now, I put still stand, standard in quotes because this is not a standard model as like standard model of uh, particle physics, but uh, it is our concordance uh, model. It seems to explain almost everything that we see. 
and it's a flat you know geometrically especially flat universe that is uh, dominated by a cosmological constant and uh, then by cold dark matter and this whole thing assumes that there's the nearly power law a nearly uh, uniform power law primordial power spectrum i just uh, in passing i should say that was another uh, direction in which i took on research uh, which was to question this assumption uh, from data rather than you know being uh, you know being uh, informed by theory or being biased by theoretical prism uh, you know um, ideas so as i said the paradigm of statistical isotropy is the predicate of the cosmological principle on which uh, cosmology was built about uh, uh, more than 100 years back now and it's important to observationally kind of verify it and the way you do it is uh, if all of you are aware that um, when we look at the sky uh, the microwave background is a the temperature of the microwave background or the fluctuations from a mean is essentially a random field on a sphere and if the sphere has no really uh, orientation to it then these fluctuations should uh, be statistically isotropic which means the two point correlation should not have a direction or if i go to multipole space the spherical harmonic multipoles of the decomposition are kind of um, uncorrelated and which is what you see in the left um, here i don't know whether you can see the cursor but this is a fundamental assumption uh, which underlies all the studies that we do with cmb almost all the studies till recently i mean most of the results assume this and go ahead however it is possible to have situations where this matrix or the you know coven's matrix is not diagonal so you have off the power in off diagonal uh, paths which you see in the on the right and this is from a old paper in 1998 and uh, with the dick bond pogosian which actually set me thinking about how does one capture all the information that is off the diagonal in a statistically isotropic universe all the information that you can get is only in the diagonal of this uh, covariance matrix whereas in general you could have information outside which needs to be you know you can't just expect to get this entire thing but you can only get something that you can you know meaningfully combine and that is statistically significant right and in 2003 uh, amir hajian uh, my first uh, phd student uh and i proposed this uh, bipolar spherical harmonic spectra which is essentially a natural generalization of the angular power spectrum so the bipolar power uh, harmonic uh, spectra spherical harmonic spectra in fact is nothing but the angular momentum addition states of uh, which captures the off diagonal elements in a kind of mathematically rigorous manner which you can see in this pink box here and these coefficients are the what we started calling the biposh coefficients and so there are two parts to it the upper uh, uh, i mean let me talk about the lower indices the lower indices are more like the you know subscript l of cl which gives you the angular scale at which you are studying the map is the harmonic decomposition of the temperature polarization map but the upper ones actually give you the harmonic decomposition of correlation patterns that are there in the universe and now in principle there exists an infinite hierarchy of bipolar harmonic uh, power spectra just like angular power spectra is just the capital l equal to 0 case but then there are this l equal to 1 onwards at all multiples a spectra that you can uh, actually generate and i mean you can actually measure out of the data of course you can't measure all of them so you have to just like you bin in nango you know l for cls you have to bin or you have to restrict your thing but there is enough information in a highly sensitive map where you can uh, glean information uh, which is beyond the statistical isotropy of the map 
And so more um, clearly, you see that uh, again, this is a bit repetitive, but what I've shown here is on the left, uh, what we assume in an isotropic universe is the two point correlation function just depends on the separation of the two directions in which you are looking. So it's a Legendre um, uh, expansion and the CLs are just coefficients of that. On the other hand, if you, and then you create this uh, angular power spectrum, and then if you have a more general two point correlation function, the most general expansion is in piriporal spherical harmonics. And the biposh coefficients are essentially the coefficients that we uh, intend to measure. Okay. So beyond angular power spectrum, you know, what would be there in the cosmic background? So universe on large, ultra large scales, you know, the, if you have a global topology, which I know, uh, you know, South Africa is you know, one of the pioneer places because you have GFRLS, right? Uh, absolutely wonderful papers, uh, which I read at the start of my career. Uh, and then you could have global and isotropy rotating matrices and uh, rotating metrics and universes where you have a breakdown of the uh, rotational symmetry. And uh, there are effects which are actually known to exist and now beginning to be measured. So the Doppler boost, the fact that uh, we are in a frame which moves with respect to the cosmic Mercury background is a measurable violation of statistical isotropy, which was first uh, carried out by Planck in 2013. And then in 2015, again, we confirmed uh, with the BIPOSH method also. Uh, so this is essentially, uh, in, for me, this is the test of the method uh, to prove any, uh, any new measure that you get. I think reproducing the Doppler boost from the data of Planck is a must. Similarly, the weak lens uh, CMB is an example of statistical isotropy violation. And in the bypass formalism, as I briefly mentioned, the weak lensing very neatly separates into odd and even parity bypass coefficients for weak lensing due to large scale structure and weak lensing due to gravitational waves, uh, background of gravitational waves. Now, the latter one, I wasn't as, uh, you know, I did it as a theoretical curiosity, but very recently one of my uh, more more recent students, Shubhadeep Mukherjee has uh, taken it more seriously and uh, is looking at various ways you can measure gravitational waves uh, against the CMB polarization background. Um, then uh, the other exciting thing about this uh, way of looking at uh, the CMB map is observations are never statistically isotropic. There are reasons for which the statistical isotropy is very clearly broken. I mean, as all of you know, when you see a CMB map, there's the galaxy, our own galaxy shines very bright across the galactic equator. And however well you remove it, there are residuals, and that itself breaks statistical isotropy. Then no uh, experiment or no uh, telescope or uh, CMB uh, mission measures the sky with equal uh, sensitivity in all directions. So, and the coverage is not uniform. So that violates statistical isotropy. And even there are more subtle effects that uh, I think uh, are not yet as, uh, in, you know, uh, as uh, comprehensively taken into account, uh, non-circular beam response function. Planck did account for it. Uh, in fact, one of my students, uh, Sanjeet, uh, was in JPL largely to work on this as a postdoc. And this, I feel, is really important as we look at uh, maps from various uh, experiments with, uh, you know, because this, it becomes more and more important as your sensitivity of the experiment goes, goes higher. Uh, so when I first talked about non-circular beam in 1998 or something uh, for Python 5, which came Ganga might remember, uh, at that time it made no difference whether you took a circular beam assumption or non-circular beam, but for WMAP and Planck, it uh, makes a huge difference. We account for that. 
So let me show you an example uh, first of something that we ought to measure and just to say that this measure works well. So we are moving with respect to this uh, screen at about 380 kilometers per second. And that creates a statistical isotopy violation due to the aberration effect, relativistic aberration, uh, and you know the amplification, uh, what you, the magnification that you have. So these two effects uh, create a very clear um, signal in the temperature and polarization pattern. And from the temperature, for example, you can estimate the known CMB dipole with these kind of accuracies that you see here in my plot, where these are estimates from the Planck data. And this is part of the Planck 2015 release, where this is measured using this measure uh, with this kind of accuracy. I mean, of course, the accuracy is nowhere compared to what we measure from the dipole itself, but it's an extremely important uh, you know, confirmation of this uh, motion of uh, our own motion with respect to the plasma microwave background. Similarly, weak lensing, as I said, you know, you could have weak lensing and the CMB photons get deflected along their path due to large scale structures, or even if there was a kind of a, a gravitational wave background, stochastic gravitational wave background, you would see this effect. And uh, what I found very neat is if you look at the deflection field of the photon, which is the temperature that you see in a direction n prime uh, is actually the temperature in a direct, uh, direction n plus the deflection uh, on the sky. The deflection field on the sky can be uh, split into a part which is the gradient of a scalar and a part that is like a curl of a um, pseudo scalar. And the interesting thing is the weak lensing, the gradient part is the scalar uh, due to density perturbations, the weak lensing due to density perturbations, and the weak lensing uh, due to tensors is the curl part. And they are captured in two types of, um, you know, uh, pi posh coefficients, one with positive, uh, parity and one with negative parity. This parity is determined by whether small l, l prime plus capital L are, is even or odd. And you know, uh, the, this is if I were to measure both the coefficients in BIPOSH, then I would be able to make out if the weak lensing signal is uh, uh, from density perturbations or not. In fact, something very similar is used to make sure that your uh, weak lensing estimation is correct uh, in you know, computing what is called the odd parity by spectrum. So this uh, method was proposed in 20, uh, 2003, but it's only in 2007, when WMAP in their second release actually made a measurement of the BIPOSH uh, coefficients and found significant deviations. Of course, they attributed it to some systematic effect because it, there was frequency dependence. And, uh, but it wasn't as clearly mentioned what the systematic effect was, but it could be any of the things like beams and uh, you know, other things. Uh, after many years, we actually carried out very careful analysis of the beams of uh, WMAP and scanned the sky with it and actually showed that this signal that the WMAP saw was entirely due to the beam and the difference that they saw in their W and V band was consistent with the differences in the asymmetry of the beams at the thing. What is impressive to, in my mind is the beam asymmetry is really a, a fraction of a, a percent, but uh, that itself creates a signal that is uh, readily measurable from a map made by WMAP. Now, finally, I get to the thing that I've been very intrigued about, which is uh, the cosmic hemispherical asymmetry. To be honest, uh, I was one of the strongest disbeliever because uh, you know this is something that people talked about and some groups always talked about it from the Kobe days. 
that if you looked at the COBE map, which would look like the Planck map at the resolution that is shown on the right here, it was very clear to the eye that the lower hemisphere has much more, much stronger fluctuations in the upper hemisphere. And this was kind of uh, initially probably attributed to just observations. But the fact that it has persisted over WMAP and Planck makes it quite interesting. So uh, as a part of the Planck team, uh, we went out to measure this. And by the time we got onto this, I should say that this did also attract a lot of uh, attention from theorists who made um, really, really many, many models. I think here my models run out in 2016, but I'm sure there are more models after that. Uh, this is a slide I st stole from Shubhadeep's uh, PhD defense. And there are features which are pretty interesting and now we have established most of them. One is the asymmetry that you see, statistical asymmetry that you see is only dipolar. We had looked at the higher multiples in the BIPOSH, like capital L going up to 30 or some 32. And there's nothing significant in any of the things that stands out as clearly as this dipolar one. That's number one. Uh, but having said that, you know, in terms of a frequentist uh, thing, this is, you know, few in thousand chances about three sigma deviation. But it is not aligned to any directions. So often, even in the Planck uh, first release, uh, there was a, a statement of made that this is not south ecliptic asymmetry, but it is not. It is distinctly away from the north south galactic. Uh, thing. So it is not aligned with that. I don't think it is aligned with the top dipole in any sense. I mean, uh, in any obvious sense. The other thing which we established with, could we establish with Planck is look at multiple maps at multiple different frequencies, three different frequencies, and show that it is uh, the same. The signal does not change. And the most important is why I was a disbeliever who started at least believing that there is something there is because it is scale dependent. You don't see it unless you are looking at absolutely the lowest resolution map, only retaining multiples up to 70. The moment you add power from higher multiples, it get, tends to wash out the signal completely. So over the duration of the uh, Planck uh, releases, uh, you know, these are things that got established and, you know, a sort of a series of work or, a, you know, plan of research uh, is something that we developed here. So one was to quantify uh, it in terms of some non posteri statistics, so which uh, by Posh, then make simulations of such maps and then do a Bayesian kind of thing, which is what I will talk about today. And then, of course, look at theoretical possibilities. And, you know, as I said, that's really not, in my opinion, not been very successful. So I would stick to this very phenomenological modeling of the violation. So we look at it as if the statistical isotropic map is multiplied by some arbitrary function, which is not a, it's a C field or it's, it's, it's like a, you know, field uh, which is not uh, stochastic, and uh, that is M. And uh, then you look at, I mean, when I say dipolar, it just means that I'm focusing on the L equal to one dipole part of this uh, M of N, right? And this equation captures what people thought was dipolar asymmetry. But this is quite inadequate because this does cannot capture the multiple dependence to fact that the A is non-zero only when you're looking at delta T uh, at coarse resolutions of multiples less than 70. So I didn't put the equation here, but uh, one has to cast this in the BIPOSH for, uh, form to, in fact, even put the modulation model where it is multiplied by a field which has only power at uh, high multiples. Nevertheless, so if you just talk about this A and allow A to be L dependent, which is what we did in uh, Planck, 
we found that it is of course scale dependent. So you see the signal is only there in the lowest bin up to 64, but rest of the bins, it's absolutely consistent with uh, uh, not being there. I mean, being zero, right? So this is that. And uh, this is basically the frequentist measure of, you know, what is the cumulative, uh, uh, the cumulative signal up to different L maxes. And you see that it sinks inside the cosmic variance band uh, at higher multiples, but at low multiples, it's uh, close to a three sigma effect. And uh, the point here is these are three different foreground removal methods and all give identical signals. So it's unlikely to be a foreground removal effect. We also looked at three different frequencies and again saw that the signal was absolutely consistent across the frequencies, which means that this is an achromatic effect. It's not something to do with uh, foregrounds or something that is frequency dependent with the instrument. So where the Planck uh, part uh, stopped was with the Planck team, we essentially gave a p-value of, um, you know, uh, six parts in thousand in the 2015 uh, SMICA map uh, to this effect being kind of something intriguing and also a direction to it where we it's very clear that it uh, the direction is quite separate so you focus on the blue one which is the low l part and you can see that it's quite distinct from the southern ecliptic pole and this uh, size of the circle this is the one sigma error of the um, you know location so then the point was, uh, what is the posterior? I mean, you know, what really, when we say, how do I assign a significance to this? So what uh, p-value is more a frequentist method. So with Ben Walden, uh, this is again a project we had been thinking since 2014, but uh, 2013 even, but never got around to it till uh, Planck uh, things were almost over. And with Shantanu Das, a former student of mine, we developed a method for uh, doing a Bayesian study of statistical asteroid violation on a sphere. So it just is, it's a general uh, formalism which works for any field uh, defined on a sphere where you want to pose this question. And later with Shabbi Sheikh, who's just uh, finished last year, and I, I believe he was considering uh, was doctoral position uh, in your group. Uh, so last year uh, is uh, led this work uh, where we did the Bayesian analysis. So there, let me show you what were the elements there. So we use the Simica map. Uh, Simica is one of the three lead ways of foreground removal in um, uh, used by Planck team. And this has, I mean, of course, I mean, let me not get into it, but it, this is kind of the one used mostly for most of the data products. And just like a power spectrum of everything in Planck was given in the form of posterior distributions. And, you know, whatever you saw as the thing was the best uh, value in, of the posterior. We wanted to give do something similar for the dipole uh, hemispherical asymmetry that we, I mean, the hemisphere, cosmic hemispherical asymmetry that has been seen. So we have the map, we have to contend with reality of a mask, which is quite ugly, uh, which is shown here. Uh, so it, it violates statistical isotropy in a very obvious way, but then the fact that there's a whole distribution of points which you hardly can see, uh, which have been poke, you know, punched out around radio sources and all, makes it even more challenging. And then the fact that the Planck uh, coverage or the noise spectrum is not uniform on the sky. The variance of this uh, map uh, is measured by Planck, varies in the very unique pattern, uh, which reflects the scanning strategy out there. So you have a map sample. And uh, so this is what you start with. The Hamiltonian Markov chain the sampling generates various realizations of the sky for you. And what I wanted to show you is, although we have an incomplete sky with the mask, region masked out, 
the region in the mask is not very distinctly different from the rest. And so it's unlikely that the mask is putting any of our uh, results or conclusions. To deal with the form of the uh, scale dependence, uh, earlier, most of the analysis was a uh, coefficient of uh, dipole anisotropy A, which was constant up to a particular multipole and zero after that. So up to a value of 70 or some 64. We now actually introduce this idea that it could be a power dependence with a power coefficient uh, alpha, uh, which also we determine uh, together with the amplitude A. So it has a amplitude uh, A at a particular pivot point and the value alpha. The pivot point choice is not very, uh, you know, it's not important. And then uh, we go and first estimate it for the step model, which was just recovering what we saw in uh, Planck with using our quadratic estimation method. And we largely uh, recovered those results with a slight difference in the direction. Okay, so you can see that the minimum variance estimator is in, shown in green, whereas our estimate is shown in red, but they are consistent within one sigma. But the fact that the coefficients are slightly different actually means that uh, the direction of the, uh, inferred direction of the dipole hemispherical asymmetry is slightly different in this Bayesian approach. So here is the plot. I cannot see. Okay, let me see if I can minimize this. Okay, yes. So now you see the final result for uh, the direction, which is this green patch. So certainly the southern ecliptic pole is beyond the one sigma and, uh, you know, kind of uh, at the outskirts. Uh, uh, so in the area of, you know, something like 0.1 relative to, you know, one so one tenth the probability there uh, but these are the various estimates of the directions within that so they are all consistent uh, within the yellow band and also the amplitudes are very well consistent across various methods that have been used and so we see a seven percent effect in amplitude which is a 14 percent effect in power in the asymmetry across the thing and then the question was, what is the statistical significance of this, right? So for that, we, okay, so this is going forward with the, sorry, I should uh, also with the power law index part. Mm -hmm. So that is also something which is very intriguing. If we allow for a power law form for the scale dependence, it very, very clearly peaks at alpha equal to minus one, so 0.912. Right, and that is extremely intriguing to me because uh, this is not a really odd thing. I mean, I one and many of us uh, would know this, that there's one effect in cosmology, which uh, actually uh, in, in the same physics, which actually gives you that almost close to minus one kind of dependence. The ISW, the integrated sachs wolf component of the CMB and isotropy actually falls up as uh, L to the power of minus one. I mean, L to the power of minus 0.8 or whatever, depends a lot on the, a little bit on the model, but roughly in the same ballpark. So, I mean, it has been intriguing, but we haven't really looked at it very carefully, may or may not work, but it would require, of course, a very gross, statistical isotropy violation in the ISW part of the signal. And that will naturally take care of the scale dependence of this asymmetry that you see. Uh, because if it is just the ISW part that is affected, you can immediately explain why it is not seen at high multiples. Also why it is not seen in the polarization map, but the polarization maps are not as uh, good at this point to make that statement very strongly, but uh, to the extent that it's been checked, there is no signal seen in polarization map. And so the question which is very intriguing is, is the ISW effect anisotropic? And which means 
that this should some be something that can be seen with uh, maybe visible more in the large scale uh, structure uh, maps uh, that will start emerging with uh, you know really path breaking uh, the new observations and surveys that are going on particularly space missions so this is something that i leave as a thought but uh, in terms of direction i think uh, whether you have a paolo model or a step model more or less you get the same thing for a paolo case as you see it's slightly more consistent with the southern ecliptic pole but uh, uh, otherwise, there's no significant difference. So this is the kind of uh, summary. So if we look at this effect, then it's uh, alpha equal to minus one slope kind of a thing uh, of A of a particular value of 0 0.05 if you take the step and 0 0.06 if you take alpha equal to 0 0.92 and uh, also shown in this plot is this green line which shows you the level at which the doppler boost which i talked about uh, earlier uh, is an effect and it you can clearly see that's kind of negligible uh, for the kind of considerations we are looking at on these scales okay and this is the distribution of alpha which i want to point out is distinctly different from a flat uh, alpha equal to zero case. Okay, so it's it's kind of very strongly away from that. Again, this uh, we didn't look at the posterior value. The other part of the thing, which was something on our mind from the uh, at that some point was, I mean, this was something on my mind from the beginning was whether the deficit in power that you see at low multiples in the CMB is connected in some way to the uh, cosmic hemispherical asymmetry are they kind of cousins which are related by some physical effect and this is again a three sigma ish effect i mean 2.7 sigma according to planck in a particular way of doing things and uh, it is something that we thought is worth checking out and we essentially uh, when you do this joint measurement we now also can measure the angular power spectrum independently as we measure the parameters of this uh, cosmic hemispherical asymmetry and we find that whether you have a fixed CL or a CL that is allowed to vary there is hardly any difference the CL that you get when you account for uh, allow for cosmic hemispherical asymmetry uh, and you don't essentially angular power spectrum is unaffected which sort of indicates that probably these two effects are not, uh, you know, related to each other. So it doesn't, I mean, the low angular power, uh, low power at uh, small angular scales uh, or large angular scales uh, is uh, not related to the cosmic hemispherical asymmetry. Okay, so on to model comparison. So the model, uh, the two models that we consider is a statistically isotropic universe, which obviously doesn't have a cosmic hemispherical asymmetry and doesn't allow for it, versus a universe which allows for the dipole level modulation. Okay. And we compute the base factor and in, a, in an approximation, but this is at the top is the base factor, which all of you are very well aware of. Okay, so this is the probability of the statistical isotropic model for given data divided by the probability of the dipole modulated data, the dipole modulated uh, model uh, given the data. Uh, one way to uh, estimate it is for models which are nested. So since the statistical isotropic model is a uh, point within the dipole modulated case where you know the dipole modulation parameters are zero you can uh, more readily compute this base factor in terms of savage decay ratio and this that is what we do with our model uh, with our with our analysis and so this is the final result so we across the spectrum of alpha this whole thing alpha is something that needs to vary because alpha part is 
you know, uh, once you go to uh, no, uh, you know, the amplitude equal to zero case, you know, alpha can take any value. So you have to look at this ratio at all values of alpha. In the range that looked reasonable to us when we did that, we find that around alpha equal to minus one or, you know, this thing. So what the ratio that you get, Savas degree ratio, the density ratio is about 0.25 in favor of uh, statistical isotropic model, which means in fact, uh, uh, you know, there's a uh, slight hint of preference for a di dipole modulation at the level of savage Deke ratio of inverse of four, right? Uh, this is of course not uh, surprising because even when you do frequentist studies, you see it's a, almost uh, barely a three sigma effect. Uh, so it is not surprising, but it is uh, probably trying to, you know, tie up the loose end of saying, okay, we have done a Bayesian uh, comparison of this. And, you know, it certainly does not rule in a statistical isotropic model very highly. So if I had a model where I had a sample from a statistical isotropic map and were to do the same analysis of the savage decay ratio, uh, I would get a factor of 1000. I would get SDDR of, um, you know, few hundreds to a thousand. So that, you know, we checked it with few sample maps, uh, which was from a statistical isotropic map. So the fact that it is 0.25 is again intriguing, uh, although I wouldn't call it evidence, but it is uh, in, in, intriguing. Okay, and also, of course, any Bayesian analysis depends on priors. And so we actually varied the prior that we put on these parameters uh, in three different ways. Uh, so the one I like most is the uniform prior in amplitude, but we also did other two priors, which were, you know, I can describe if someone is interested. But in all the cases, you can see more or less the savage Dickey ratio is, uh, you know, you know, well contained within 10. Okay, um, so that is what I wanted to present uh, as our work and uh, more work is on now. So we are essentially now uh, doing a Bayesian analysis of the, um, you know, uh, Doppler boost parameter in light of facts that there are some models now which kind of talk about uh, uh, you know very high motions of our uh, galaxy with respect to the CMD or you know talk about very large flows so I felt that it was important to uh, you know kind of nail this uh, in a you know and provide a posterior for the Doppler boost uh, and also the fact that we don't have, I mean, the obvious generalization would have been, uh, next step would have been to work on polarization maps, but we do not have such big uh, sky polarization maps. Uh, they are just beginning to get uh, going and that would be something to work on. But uh, summary of what I presented here, uh, let me say that the, you know, so again, I can't see the first point, but uh, Okay, I can now. So it is a phenomena that is being seen in the Planck's maps. It's uh, been seen in a not a designer statistics, which I wanted to emphasize. The BIPOSH is a very natural measure. It doesn't really uh, qualify as something. It's just like, uh, you know, as general as angular power spectrum. We have done analysis up to pretty uh, high multiples and don't see it at high multiples and the low multiples thing is that frequentist value is at three sigma and as i said uh, you know you can also do a bayesian thing which is the results that i talked about and it's frequency independent so now we have a full formalism which we can use to jointly get the angular power spectrum and the uh, statistical isotopy violation in fact, we can also get few of the, you know, bypass coefficients themselves for a few of the low Ls together with it. We have done such things for L equal to two. <laughs> These results are being looked at now. Um, these are things that Shabir had done. 
but uh, we, you know, we, he never got around to publishing it by the time he finished his PhD. So it's still un, not done, finished in the thing. And as I said, you know, the best uh, available CMB data do not rule out a non-sky CMB sky. I, I want to emphasize that because to my mind, it would have been uh, very interesting to see uh, base factor at least of the order of 10 in favor of a statistical isotropy model. And then, you know, that would have said, okay, that's kind of uh, something not really there. Uh, so it may signal that, uh, you know, it may signal new physics and merits continued attention, particularly with polarization and weak lensing maps. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tanana. Um, so we can take some questions. Um, I know NJ uh, had a question, but uh, before that, any students, uh, do you have any questions for Tarun? Uh, Shion. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, uh, Tarunda, I just wanted, not, not a question, I just wanted to point out one thing is like, uh, uh, the reason behind the uh, dipolar modulation power spectrum and the actual power spectrum is right because the correction is in order of square of the modulation amplitude, right? That's why it's almost similar. No, no, no. So that is if the angular power spectrum, uh, you know, the dipolar modulation does correct for the angular power spectrum, but if the physics was connected, then you would have seen, so for example, if uh, this dipolar modulation, of course, that's di very difficult to imagine, was from something like cosmic topology, then cosmic topology model, models that create a dipolar or any kind of statistical isotopy violation at low L's, typically they do that at low L's, would be also accompanied by a power deficit because there is a uh, cutoff at uh, low powers. Uh, because of the finiteness of the space. So in that sense, uh, we wanted to see if this was an effect which simultaneously produced uh, an isotropy as well as power deficit. So it's different from what you uh, point out, uh, a, di a modulation, a multiplication of a statistical isotropy map by this at the second order does create a effect in the CL, but that is very small for the values of you know, modulation that we're looking at. Yeah, yeah. And one more thing I wanted to ask is like, uh, we, we, can we get any intuition from like, uh, we can get an intuition like uh, the Doppler boost will create a dipolar modulation in the spectrum, uh, the uh, uh, CMB. And uh, is there any intuitive way of thinking like that this effect uh, will give this modulation? I mean, I know yeah, that yeah. non circular no, so for L equal to one, that's why we call, you know, not we called it actually, there's a paper by Mark Kamenkowski, which is titled the pesky cosmic asymmetry or something like that, or have pesky in a hemispherical asymmetry, because there are very, it's, it's been very difficult to come up with the easy way of modeling it. If you look at cosmic topology, you can get L equal to two. Uh, Momita uh, actually worked uh, with me on the violation of this in the Boltzmann function itself, Boltzmann distribution itself of CMB. And there, if you have a magnetic field, for example, again, you get L equal to two, uh, not L equal to one. L equal to one is very, very uh, puzzling. It, it's not amongst the easiest things to find a theoretical model for. And for example, the asymmetry in the power spectrum cannot uh, create a L equal to if the underlying power spectrum P of K vector it has a di it cannot have a dipole asymmetry, it can have a quadruple asymmetry. So these are very intriguing. That's why I you know the title of my talk. I mean, I, I find it very intriguing. And non circular beam response function that also gives like L equal to two effect, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you, Sean. Uh, any other questions from students? Okay, I can't see anything. Okay, so uh, Inja, um, if you're around, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, okay. Hi, Torun. Uh, 
Uh, I'm Yinji Ma here, so uh, nice to uh, listen to it. Hi, how are you doing? Right, good, good, very yeah. nice. Yes, so uh, George F. Stasi and I and Anthony Chandler, we wrote uh, some papers on this and the correlation functions. Uh, probably you have uh, saw them. And um, and basically, uh, so I have actually two two questions. So one is that we I feel that to compare, you know, at, at your last step of uh, doing the Bayesian comparison of the uh, SI model and the other is MD model, I think, uh, given mm -hmm. the data. Um, so yeah, I mean, you, you, it's okay to do such comparison, but I, I think it's a, the better comparison would be the um, the underlying physics model. You know, if you have two versions other than lambda CDM, what is the probability of two different physical models given the data? Right. So in that aspect, I think it's really hard to find any alternative model that could provide the equally fit uh, you know, uh, then lambda CDM and and feeding right. all other CMB features uh, plus this and this entropy. Yeah. Yes. No, I completely agree with you. So uh, uh, we are, you know, actually comparing a phenomenological model uh, here. Uh, but uh, as you rightly pointed out, there isn't a compelling model which you would like to spend time to kind of uh, rule out because they most of the ones I am aware of might may be wrong, but seem to be pretty contrived because you have to do a lot to get uh, uh, L equal to one signal which dies off. Uh, an exception to that, which again, going back to my uh, pet thought, whether is this, this something to do with uh, the integrated Sachs wolf I think we had done some preliminary work on it and it requires uh, immense uh, uh, kind of disparity in the uh, large scale structure uh, that would obviously show up in the weak lensing. So the other thing I should mention, which uh, one of my students who is here uh, was also looking at is, uh, you know, looking at weak lensing in the bypass formalism and try to see if uh, you can look at that. Momita herself had worked on some things where we looked at uh, lensing by a statistically anisotropic lensing potential. And uh, so that is one possibility, but um, I that the next batch of students who are joining would be taking up this project. So there are a lot of interesting projects, I think, which can yeah. be done. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so my second, uh, yeah, may I just quickly ask because the time yeah, is sure, over. Sure. So uh, so the, my second question is, uh, is, it's very interesting to see that you find this alpha almost minus one in terms yes. of the uh, large scale and the isotropy that you suspect it may come from the ISW on the very large scales. So I wonder to confirm this, we probably need some really large scale, large angular coverage of the large scale right. structured data to reconstruct the template of, of ISW and to see whether right. that can make up this this you know the slow minus one effect on the very large scale, isn't it? So I guess the observational uh, demand for such really large angle, large angular scale observation uh, optical data or radio, you know, other multivalence yeah. data would be quite demanding, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Uh, okay. I should also mention that there's a generic problem with all my talks that I'm pretty bad at citing uh, people. So please don't mind the fact that, you know, I have uh, not cited many papers. I find it, uh, you know, it, it does, you know, it, it is something that one should do, but I have always found myself out of time and I would rather not do it uniformly. And I, this is something that I intend to say at the beginning of my talk, but let me apologize to others also who may have missed, uh, oh, you know. Okay, no problem, no, no problem, yeah. okay. Uh, okay. Just, just for time being, uh, sorry, go ahead, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, so the, the last quick one is uh, you you have mentioned the uh, plunk 100 143 and 2 217 gigahertz map and you basically reconstruct reconstruct the dipole on these three maps uh, mm. and I I buy that but but my question is uh, uh, usually plunk combine multi frequency map to remove the foreground so that they can recover a full map and and therefore to reconstruct any dipole on the full map, but if you only have three different frequencies, that they each of these frequencies do have quite a large chunk in the galactic plane that being yes. uh, uh, contaminated, 
how can you really reconstruct the dipole over the full sky? No, we can. I mean, so that is the thing. So, of course, the reconstruction with a big mask is a problem. When we did it as a part of the Planck team, we essentially uh, modeled it out with simulations, the signal that you get from the mask. So you, you take the mask for each of the frequencies and then make many realizations of statistical isotropic cases and you know the signal that you get you take it out which is not ideal but now if we were to do it again uh, we would be able to deal with masks and we are now fairly confident that we can deal with 70 percent f sky so in fact uh, shubhadeep and uh, uh, a few of us were actually targeting uh, now doing this analysis with uh, maps that come from s4 Okay, I see. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I guess yeah. a reconstructed di the contour of the direction which you show on the map would be larger if the effective area of your oh, data yes. is, is less. Yes, right? yes. So, so that's why there I didn't show you the, uh, you know, direction in the sky. They are not best for determining the direction in the sky. But the fact that they are broadly consistent is quite heartening. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I think Martin has a question. Yeah, my my question might be more a mathematics question than a cosmology question. So um, I think I understand the argument, you know, with a sort of toroidal um, compactification or non-trivial cosmology where you tend to get, you know, sort of forward, backward, symmetric, or even L um, asymmetry. Right. <laughs> um, but I was wondering if you look at sort of um, in hyperbolic space, yes. there's some rather exotic compactifications. Has anybody looked whether that might <laughs> Um, allow a way out. Yeah, so no, so this is direction of evil rather than an axis of evil. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a very interesting question, Martin, because I did visit it. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we had a very bright student in Ayuka who was working on this uh, way back, I think, you know, maybe almost 10 years back. Uh, Momita remembers her very well, very close friend of Momita. So she actually has, I have notes uh, which show you that in for compact topologies or, or, or non-trivial topologies, you can show that the Biposh spectrum is only even uh, if you have a spherical geometry or a Euclidean geometry. The only case where you can have odd L bipo, uh, biposhes is hyperbolic geometry. And that you can mathematically show which is it's a, it's a very interesting result which i you know I, I should find time to sit and you know finish it into some uh, paper but it's been lying with me but i i can tell you that's a uh, very very nice thing that you noted and i do have in mind that there are actually models and compact hyperbolic models have this interesting thing that uh, they are absolutely well classified in you know it's it's like a very beautiful classification and one could envisage a situation where you could take some of the most promising ones with which whose volumes are large enough compared to the curvature radius and so where you would have some effect and uh, then you can rule them out one by one or uh, kind of study them one by one and it is true that that is the only place where i can imagine such a thing happening I don't know if you remember a paper by Ivan's, uh, I can't pronounce his name, Scanapiccio or um, and Joe Silk and um, um, and and uh, Jana Levin, where they actually also looked at, I think, uh, this uh, possibility where you know one side of the universe is hotter than the other, and you know one possible way to explain that is there in one of the compact hyperbolic models. So I guess the challenge for 
reality would be you would have to drive um, Omega curvature far enough from zero right. so that the compactification scale wouldn't be too far away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So you have to play around with Make that. It's tiny, I, I guess that would yeah. be the challenge. No, but uh, I, I think this, uh, you know, I just moved to a place with a whole bunch of very bright students and I, I in fact have in mind to kind of do it over time with, you know, students taking bits of this. It's, it's a long program of activity where you want to, you know, methodically rule these out. And I think uh, you have this classification in terms of the volume of the spaces with respect to uh, the uh, curvature, in, in, in terms of the curvature, in fact. So, and then you can sort of see what works. But yeah, it requires a program of activity. And I think uh, it, it's not something I have done, but uh, definitely worth doing. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks, Martin.